previous two were chatting with you all, I noticed Arnton's in the house. They made it the whole way up here. So everybody turn around and go, whoop, whoop. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? And not only that, Iberia's in the house. So we got the north and the south. And I noticed that we have first and second Newark in the house. And we have Marysville in the house. I know. So people from the farthest reaches of our presbytery are all here in the building, and there are others online. So I'm pretty excited about that. But I want you to know that this day is one of the first things that I learned about this presbytery. When I was here last year, it was like my third weekend of being in the presbytery. And this was the most exciting event that we had all year. <laughs> so, you know, I'm pretty excited to have spent some time with the planning team and this year's workshops are going to be amazing as well. The best part is I have like a list of other workshops that we could have, but we only have so much time and it's already hard to pick between which ones we want. So know that there will be some other opportunities for some things happening throughout the course of the year. There's a book study happening on William Yu's book, What Kind of Christianity. There will be other studies happening. There will be other events happening. So the e-news is your ticket to knowing what all's happening. If you have not yet been receiving the e-news, you can get it at a very low price of zero dollars. <laughs> All you have to do is go to the website, click on the, on the news, and you can sign up right there to get the e-news delivered free to your email every Thursday morning at 6.30 a.m. Now, we are not requiring that you read through the e-news at 6.30 a.m. It will wait for you. <laughs> it will wait for you for whatever time of day you want to read it. However, I will tell you, if you're not checking it out, you're missing a lot of things. For example, if you haven't received the e-news, you have no idea that there is a new program happening at the Synod. What, you say? I know. This program is going to help all of our presbyteries get really good preachers. Now wait, we're not sending our pastors to this training. You got what you got. But if you ever thought that you could maybe want to fill a pulpit once in a while, and maybe we could convince you if you thought you got some training, please talk to me. I already have a very short list of people who are ready to sign up even before the program went live, but now the program is going live. So I need to know if you're interested, talk to me because we'll get you on the scoop. Now, there's also an ability that if you decide you want to do more, we've got classes to become a commissioned pastor. You don't have to go to seminary. You can do online classes. And it's not three years like your pastor had to do. It's only about a year. Eh, two if you want to take your time. But you can do amazing things in this presbytery if only you're open to hearing God's call. As I told the folks at Lythop or, or at Gala Police last week, ring, 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 ring. Thank you. <laughs> you know, we're getting way too lazy. With our cell phones, what do we do when it rings and we, get, we look and see who it is first, right? Uh, I, I'm guilty. I understand. But then we go, should we answer it? We do the same thing to God. Oh, yeah. We hear tap, tap, tap from God, and we go, eh, not right now, I'm busy. Or, mm, I'm not so sure I feel like taking this call right now. Because God might want to send me to Africa to be a missionary. Um, maybe, but chances are, no. God is going to want you to be a missionary right where you are. And so you don't even have to move. 
but you do have to do something. And first thing you need to do is answer the call. So the next time you get a ring, 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 thank you. I knew you could do it. I want you to answer God's call in however that is in your life. So I'm pretty excited that we have a lot of great workshops, but most of, mostly I'm excited because we get Chip Hardwick all day. I know. So we are going to take advantage of that. Are you going to do his? Okay. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy because the Kathy Kathy team is pretty awesome, right, Kathy's? <laughs> so <laughs> there are so many Kathy's in this room today, it's <laughs> wonderful. It means people can say, well, that's Kathy's fault, and it's not me. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so as we get prepared to call um, Chip up forward, part of our, because we have folks with us online, hi, folks online, um, it, they're able to live stream it. What that also means is for ch folks in your church who were not able to attend and or um, other folks who, when you go back and say, I, heard, I was part of a great keynote, these are going to be posted online. So they're both live stream right now. But if you want to go home and let's say you didn't pick the elder workshop that will be online um, that Kathy's going to be doing later, you could watch it. So we're, we're, we're trying all the tech today. Um, and we do have wonderful workshop leaders here. I do want to say one more thing in regards to all of our, uh, as Kathy mentioned, the folks from north, south, east, and west. Please take advantage of this time to chat with folks you might not normally do. You know, uh, particularly as you leave your workshop, because we've, we've got our keynote, then our workshop, and we'll go straight into lunch. Please take that time. As you leave your workshop, maybe you were in with some other clerk training. Maybe sit with those clerks um, and, and, and chat about some of those ideas. As you're leaving the creation care, maybe sit and chat with those people more than you might. Um, so. All that to say, I think we're ready. Did I, did I stall a good amount of time? 9.31. Uh, we're going to invite um, Chip Hardwick for, as many of you know Chip, our, our uh, Senate executive. We've been so fortunate to have him lead some workshops in the past, and we decided he needed more time to talk to more people. Um, so we're delighted he's here with us giving our keynote. He'll also be leading a workshop this afternoon that kind of follows up on what he's talking about this morning, and he'll, I'm sure, tell us more about that. So let's welcome Chip. Good morning. I didn't get a chance to test my mic. It sounds like it's good. Is it good out there? All right, I'm seeing some thumbs up from the very back. That's great. I am really glad to be here. This is, I think it's the fourth time that I've done something with Pi. I, well, <laughs> I have done something with Pi a lot of times, <laughs> but this is the fourth time that I have participated in leading something at this Pi, and I'm really glad to be here. Our other presbyteries don't have anything like this. You know, we have 11 presbyteries, and none of them have a big event like this, um, particularly when so many people are here in person and then also so many people online. So um, we're, I'm really grateful to be a part of it. And it's so fun for me to um, see Kathy in action. You know, Kathy has, I don't, I'm not sure that I've gotten to see you speak in public before, and you're awesome. You're awesome at so many things, but you're also awesome at speaking in public. So. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to have Kathy as a colleague. Um, she's very supportive of me, and I try to be supportive of her, and I'm really grateful. I'm also glad to see Emily. He, where's Emily, my longtime friend from seminary? And I'm especially glad to see Susan and Kathy, who were students in a polity class that I taught. And I'm really glad they're, they, um, they brought such great insight to that class, and I'm really glad to see you all in person. So thank you. Um, so much. They're also extremely familiar with my slide format. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, thank you again for having me. And I want to do a little bit of homework um, right from the beginning. Let's see if this is going to work for me. This, Brian, this doesn't seem to be moving forward. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Oh before, oh, before I give you a little bit of homework, just this is our synod. It's the 11 Presbyteries. It's pretty much Ohio and Michigan. I wonder if anybody could guess how many Presbyterian churches we have in Ohio and Michigan? 300. 300, more than 300. It's a good guess, though. 11,000, less than 11,000. <laughs> um, what was the number over here? 
620, it's about 650, about 650. And then how many Presbyterian members do you think are in those 650 churches total, approximately? One million, that would be great. It's less than one million. 11,000, it's more than 11,000. It's about 85,000. We have about 85,000 members in our synod and our, um, if you can go ahead. Brian, should I just leave this alone? Yeah. Oh, by the way, I was telling Brian earlier, you know how tech people only get noticed when things go wrong? So let's give Brian a round of applause from the start. He was here early and helping me get into shape and um, had to reformat all of my slides. So, um, Brian, thank you so much. Um, our motto is in our synod, we'll try anything to equip leaders who tend to God's emerging creative future. And I hope that today will be um, a small step in that direction. And I do wanna tell you about a couple of new ministries. If you can go to the next slide, Brian, and just skip to the, yeah, thank you. Um, so this is the initiative that Kathy mentioned, Cultivating the Gift of Preaching. We got a $1.25 million grant from the Lilly Foundation. Um, it came in a plain envelope, in a regular envelope with a regular check for $1.25 million <laughs> that I took to my regular bank and shocked all of the people there. Um, so we're grateful for the generosity of the Lilly Foundation. And as Kathy said, it's a program to help congregational leaders um, learn how to preach. It's an 18 month cohort program and um, there'll be four cycles, four 18 month cycles. So if you're not able to do it this year, maybe you're able to do it next year or the year after or the year after. And we hope that over the course of those four cycles, we'll have about 140 new preachers trained in our synod. Um, to be able to um, preach effectively in their churches. So I hope you'll think about it um, if you um, have ever had an inkling or if you've had the opportunity to preach and think you'd like some more training, um, this would be a great program for you. The other new um, ministry that we have, we've just hired Tim Pollock to be a commissioned ruling elder slash commissioned pastor coordinator. So he's gonna work with presbyteries to develop the ministries that they have and so presbyteries can learn from each other. And um, we're excited that you all are um, already emphasizing this ministry too and Tim will be a good help for you. Now I think I've got some homework for you. Yes, yeah, so I want you to write down, write down, to, well I'll give you 90 seconds to write down your definition of church. Just write down what your definition of church is. You're not gonna have to share it with anybody. Um, you don't have to turn it in or anything. It's just for, it's, I've got a, I'm gonna have a question about it a little bit later in the presentation, but just write down, I'm gonna give you 90 seconds, write down how you would define church. Chris and Nancy Dederer, everyone. We're writing down a definition of church. So if you can write down a definition of church. You don't have to share it with anybody or anything, just write, it, write down a definition of church. All right, you got five more seconds. All right, according to my watch, it says you should be done. Um, now, just hold on to these. We're gonna come, I'm going to come back to them in a little bit, but I wanted to um, get your thoughts before we started. So if you can go to the next slide, please, Brian. So um, college football playoff, that was a few weeks ago. Wasn't it great who played? Yeah, who, who were the teams that played in the college football playoff? 
a cheater team, yeah, a cheater team. Yeah, it, it, did, did Ohio State make the playoff this year? No, well then let's go back. Let's go back to this one, to the next slide, please. We're gonna go back to 2014, right? So we're gonna talk about 2014, college football. Um, who, who was the national champion in 2014? Buckeyes, right? It's right on the screen. So um, that was a really exciting game. Does anybody remember anything about that game? What? Yeah, the, the, yeah. Cardell Jones, the third string quarterback. Hey, Do anybody remember who you played? Oregon, what the score was? Wow, we got a fan of 42. Yeah, so let's see. So th this, it was very exciting, right? It was super exciting. Um, I, I had a friend from high school, his mom watched the game that night and then she watched it again that same night. That's how excited she was. I, I went to high school in Beaver Creek. I'm, I, I'm from Beaver Creek, so grew up with, in Ohio also. So, um, so it was very exciting. Um, go ahead, please. The, it was in Oregon, right? And the score was 42 to 20, so that was exciting, right? Who was the coach? Urban Meyer was the coach. That was exciting, right? Um, what, it was Cardell Jones, so it was the third string quarterback. That was exciting, right? And you know what was not exciting? The huddles. The huddles were not the most exciting part of this game. In fact, the huddles, my, my deep theological conviction is that huddles are the reason that God created DVRs, so that when you're watching the game, you can fast forward through the huddles and get to the game, right? <laughs> Nobody watches a football game to watch the huddles. Now, it's not that huddles aren't important, right? Huddles are important. I did not play football myself. Um, did any of you play football? All right, tell me what happens in a huddle. You learn the play, you learn the play, what's, what play is coming, what else happens in a huddle? You're told what to do in the huddle, right? So you gotta know what's coming, you gotta know what to do. I understand from a friend of mine that's a football coach, you know, you kind of get each other hyped up, you make sure everybody knows where to line up, you know, to make sure they know what to do. But the thing is, are football games for the huddles? No, the, the huddles are for the game, right? The game is not for the huddles. The huddles are for the game. So the huddles are important, but if you can go to the next slide, Brian, the huddles aren't the game. The huddles are the purpose of the huddle to prepare for the game. Because nobody ever won a football game by staying in the huddle, right? So I want to tell you, if, and if huddles were um, not the game in football, they also weren't the game back in Jesus' time. So I'm going to take you to a scripture now when the um, disciples were in a huddle. They were in a little holy huddle. This is after, this is John 20, so it's after, it's the evening of the first Easter when Jesus has risen from the dead. And the disciples, it says it was the first day of the week, that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. So the disciples are all together behind closed doors. They are, go ahead, Brian, they're in their huddle, right? They're figuring out what to do next, figuring out what the play is. They're figuring out, you know, they're probably trying to support each other and encourage each other. And then the next thing that happens is this. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not content to have them in their holy huddle. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Uh, go ahead, Brian. He's sending them out into the game, right? The huddle is important, but it's not the game. Go ahead, one more slide, Brian. So what do we know about Jesus' mission from this little short passage? What are some things that pop out about Jesus' mission from this little passage? Well, what's about, about Jesus' mission? Yeah, Jesus, we're gonna get to the church's mission in a second, but what's Jesus' mission? What's, what do we learn about Jesus' mission from this? 
Excuse me? To train disciples, right? Because he's talking to the disciples and equipping them to do something, right? What, what, does he, what does he say to them twice? Peace be with you, right? And then what does he do? Breathe on them and does them his hands, right? So and then we've missed one thing that I noticed also. Go ahead, Brian. He says, um, he's, he, is, he doesn't say I'm with you always, but he comes to be with them in the huddle. So Jesus accompanies them in their time of need. Then he, as you said, he says, peace be with you. And then he um, shows them his hands that, were, that he was sacrificed for them. And it really leads to Jesus's mission to love the world sacrificially. He comes to bring peace. He's with them always. So if that's Jesus's mission, um, what's the church's mission? Preach the gospel, right? That's part of the church's mission. To equip, that's part of the church's mission. I'm, I'm going a little simpler because he, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me on this mission, so I am sending you on this mission. It's the same mission. Spread the word. So to, to accompany people always, if Jesus' mission was to be with people, our mission is to be with people. The next thing, our mission is to bring peace. Jesus brings peace. He says, as the Father has sent me to bring peace, so I send you to bring peace. Um, remember, Jesus um, loved the world sacrificially. I don't think that we are called to be crucified the way that Jesus is in our, in our culture. There could be other cultures where people really um, undergo physical violence because of their faith, but the idea that we love the world sacrificially rather than putting ourselves first, we put other people first, that that's part of the mission that Jesus gives us too. So the mission that, Jesus, that God gives Jesus, the Father sent me, so I send you. If you can go to the next slide, I think that's what it says. Yeah, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So we have the same mission that Jesus has. Um, and Jesus equips us, and as you, you all said, Jesus equips the disciples, that he breathes on them with the Holy Spirit. It's not like Jesus is like, all right, go out and do this. I'll be sitting back and watching. Hope it goes well for you. You know, Jesus is equipping them by the power of the Holy Spirit to do this mission. Um, so this means something really important. I'm glad it's, it's 946. You get this really important point at the early part of the day. I give you permission to sleep the rest of the day. As long as you, stay, as long as you pay attention for about the next 30 seconds, you can sleep for the rest of the day. This means that if we are following Jesus out into the world to love the world sacrificially, this means that the primary beneficiaries of the fact that a church exists are not people inside the church, but people outside the church, right? That if, um, like Jesus, who, Jesus did not come, <laughs> newsflash, Jesus did not come to earth for his own benefit, Jesus came to the earth for our benefit. And so churches, as important as it is to worship together, as important as it is to have Bible study together, as important as it is to have coffee hour and fellowship dinners, as important as it is to offer pastoral care to each other, those are all things that are really part of the huddle that prepare us, we've heard, for the, the, what's the point of the huddle? To prepare for the game, right? So those are all things, they're important. It's not that all those things aren't important. All of those things are very important, but they're not the game. And if we focus only on those things, we turn out to be the primary beneficiaries of the fact that the church exists, rather than the people outside of the church being the primary beneficiaries of the fact that the church exists. You probably have heard the question, some people um, ask it, I often have thought about it, that if your church disappeared, who would, would there be community, people in the community that were not your friends, but people in the community that would care that your church went away? Right, so imagine it's Christmas Eve, everybody's there and there's an earthquake that swallows up your whole church. Um, Sure, it would be in the paper, but would it be in the paper only because of what happened to you? Or would it be in the paper because it was a tragedy for the community, too? 
is remember if we are sent out the way that Jesus was sent out to the world, if we're sent out like Jesus, the primary beneficiaries of the fact that a church exists are not the members of the church. They're the people in the community. Now let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so again, it's, I'm, I'm gonna repeat this a number of times. The huddles are important, right? The huddles are important, but we know that the game is the thing. The game is the thing. So um, go to the next slide. I wanna go um, look at your definitions of church. So everybody look at your definitions of church. This is, um, this is, um, this is I'll, 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 I'll tell you when I did this before and then we're gonna see what happened with you all. So I did this before, I asked um, people on Facebook what their definition of church was and then I deleted all of the pastor's responses because pastors talk about this stuff all the time and I just really did not care what pastors, I mean, I, lo I love pastors, don't you love pastors? I love them, but I'm not particularly interested in what they think about what the church is because they have <laughs> thought about it for, you know, for a long time, they thought about it. I'm much more interested in what happens, um, what other people think about what the church is. So I um, got a bunch of responses and then I also asked in some Bible studies at the church where I was serving at the time and got 92 answers to what the church is. Their answers probably like yours. So um, how many of those 92 answers do you think talked about the huddle? Mentioned something about the huddle. So I'm gonna ask you how many mentioned something about the huddle and how many mentioned something about the game? And of course, they might have mentioned something about both, right? So how many do you think um, mentioned something about Bible study or worship or coming together or something like that? How many do you think mentioned something about the huddle? All of them? Yeah, all of them, every single one. Now, how many of them do you think mentioned something about going beyond themselves? Something about going beyond themselves, something about reaching out, something about... Um, the church benefiting people outside of the church. How many, turn to somebody near you and say how many you think of the 92, how many mentioned that? <laughs> mentioned. <laughs> All right, somebody in the back, back there, give me a guess. Some, 46, lower than 46, how about there? Two, it's higher than two. It's not a lot higher than two, but it's higher than two. 30, it's lower than 30. 20. 20, it was exactly 20. What's your name? Linda. Linda, let's give Linda a round of applause. If you were on Card Sharks, Linda, I'd put my money on you. Um, now, let's do the same thing with you, right? Look at the definition that you wrote. Look at the definition that you wrote. And if you said something about the huddle, something about Bible study, something about worship, something about coming together, something about that, um, raise your hand. You said something about the huddle. All right, so I see a lot of hands up. How many of you said something about the game? Oh, a lot of hands, that's great. That's great, I'm surprised and happy. <laughs> Which of you, um, tell me somebody that wrote, somebody that, um, th this is, um, remember we have a prayer of confession every week so we can talk about answers that aren't quite good, you know? So um, who wrote something that was just about the huddle? Somebody that wrote something, you sir in the green, could you just tell us what you wrote? Yep, and what's your name? Bob, Bob. thank you Bob. Right, a, a worshiping group of people, and that's completely right, right? That is, that is, that is absolutely. Right, so that's a very accurate depiction, right? It's just not a complete depiction, right? It's true and accurate, it's just not complete, right? So who wrote, um, maybe one more person that wrote only mentioning the, um, the huddle? Somebody else, Bob was brave. All right, what's your name? Yeah. What is it? Gina. Gina, thank you, Gina. <laughs> so
So that is the game, right? That's the game. Did anybody else, before we, before we, well, let's give Gina a round of applause. Also, and Bob. All right, did somebody else just talk about the huddle? Somebody else that just talked about the huddle want to share? We love you because you, you are willing to step out in faith. There were a lot of hands. Who, who wrote something just about the huddle? Yes, please. Coming in from the back, we love it. Yeah, yeah. That has a little bit of, um, of game in it also, right? Because what Jesus told us to do was to go out to the world. Right, thank you. Now, how about another person? What's your name? Mona, thank you, Mona. All right, how about somebody that talked about the, the game? Go ahead. The believers who were gathered together, those who were gathered in his name. That's a little bit more like the huddle, right? Yeah, a little bit more like the huddle, right? Um, and again, it's a good answer. It's just not a complete answer because that, it is true that churches do that. But if churches only do that, then it turns out that the beneficiaries of the fact that the church exists are us and not the world. How about, how about somebody that um, talked something about the huddle? Yes, please. Perfect, right? So she mentioned both the huddle and the game. I love it. Thank you. What, what's your name, Lisa? Lisa, thank you, Lisa. How about one more that talked about the game? Let's hear it. I think that's a, so I don't know if you could hear her. She, what's your name? Eileen. Eileen talked about how it's God's word to all people so that we um, react and live into what God calls us. I'm not saying exactly what you said, but to bring the, um, and I think because you talk about all people and not just people who are already Christians, I think that's a good um, spot for the, the game. So I, I do this exercise because I, th I think that we, that many of us, um, we can nod along to a, a presentation like this, and I'm one of these people, but if you scratch me, I probably think primarily about how the church helps one another. You know, so it's a helpful exercise to do this. I, I was reminded I went to a confirmation class in, um, in Cleveland, and um, at the end of the class, it was super fun. They were, the kids were really, um, you know, there were like five or six kids and they had a lot of questions and everything. And then at the end, they did like one of the prayers, you know, when you squeeze the hand of the person next to you and if you don't want to pray, you know, it just goes along. Well, this one boy um, had this prayer to say. Um, if you go to the next one. He said, dear God, help our church to be more important to the people outside it than to the people inside it. Such a simple thing to say. So hard to do but so important to do. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh, um, I have to, actually, I forgot to bring my notes up for this. So there is a book called, um, a, well, I want to tell you what it is accurately, just a second. A New Day in the City, Urban Church Revival, and it's by um, Donna Claycomb Sokol, and L. Roger Owens. I just led a book group on this in, um, in Ashland, Ohio. It was an excellent conversation, and the church was not particularly urban, but the whole purpose of the book is to talk about getting outside of ourselves. And these are churches that were the two, past, the two authors had served, um, church, were serving churches that used to be a lot bigger than they were now. Anybody else part of a church that used to be a lot bigger? <laughs> than it is now. I mean, I don't know where we would find a church like that. And, um, and so they talk about how, they, how God um, worked with them and their congregations to try to serve the community and connect with the community better. So um, in this book, they talk about the lifeboat station. It's a parable by Theodore Weddell. And you might have heard this idea, but I think it's very well written. So I'm just going to read the whole thing. 
It's, um, it's a parable of a small life-saving station on the coast of a sea where numerous shipwrecks occurred. Many devoted members kept watch of the sea, using their one boat to go out and save sailors who became stranded in the dangerous waters. The small station soon became famous for saving lives, and its reputation attracted many people who wanted to be part of their work. New personalities arrived at the station and concluded that the interior of the building was not up to snuff. They transformed the station with new furniture and a fresh coat of paint, believing they needed a more beautiful space in which to gather and attract more members. Soon, the saving station's crew members became more adept at relaxing and enjoying fellowship inside the walls of the beautiful building on the edge of the sea than they were at going out to sea to save people from drowning. They nearly forgot the entire purpose of their existence. When a large ship was wrecked off the coast, boatloads of people were brought to the station, but the property committee determined that the diverse group of individuals was too dirty to come inside, so showers were constructed outside. We love building committees, though. This, I feel like this gives building committees a little bit of a hard time. Some crew members loved the saving station as a place to have fun and meet new people, while other crew members clung to their mission of saving lives at sea. When the two sides became bitterly divided, a meeting was called to determine whether they would seek out, save, and welcome anyone who needed their help or provide a clubhouse atmosphere where people could gather for fun. Those members who insisted that the reason they existed was to save lives always found themselves on the losing end of the vote. Still determined to make a difference, they would go off and start a new saving station only to find that the same division would reoccur after time. While many shipwrecks continued to happen on this coast today, most of the people lost at sea drown, even with a lifeboat station on every block of the shore. Then the authors write after that, they say, we've thought a lot about this parable over the years. Does the faith community you know best focus on providing beautiful space in which people can come in and rest for a while, perhaps an hour or two each week? Or does your faith community focus on making sure drowning people are rescued both spiritually and physically? What is most striking about this parable is the way it helps the church to think about its one focus, its one mission, to participate in the wide, merciful mission of God. I think um, sometimes with our buildings, I think that we need to ask the question, is our building an asset to the community or is it a clubhouse for our members? Now, I want to um, share about a church in, um, up in the Mackinac Presbytery in northern Michigan um, who has done a good job of not becoming, uh, um, they have done a good job of remembering that the reason the church exists is to benefit the community rather than the members. Um, I'm going to um, introduce you, that there's a videotape of an interview I did with Paula. She is a member, she's not the pastor of this church, she's a member of the church, she'll tell you a little bit about her church, and um, she'll, you'll hear some examples of the way that they have reached out to others. And um, this is about 10 minutes long. Hi, I'm here with Paula Larson. Hi, Paula, we're so glad you're here to tell us about some ways that your church has been reaching out to your community. Um, first of all, what community are you in? What city is your church in? Hey, Chip, we are located in Boyne City, Michigan. We're about 45 minutes south of the Mackinac Bridge. And if you know Boyne, USA, it's a very outdoorsy place. We have downhill skiing and a lot of summer activities. We've got about 41 members. It's a snowbird community. And what does that mean? That people leave um, for the winter. So our membership really declines and the people that attend the services go to, down to less than 20 in the winter time. We've, um, I'm a CRE, I'm a volunteer, and then we have one part-time um, staff person that um, just volunteers and then he also does like two services. And then one Sunday we do our community Sunday and that's what we're here to talk about today. Is yeah. what, what are we doing? Yeah, your community Sundays have been very impressive to me. And I wonder, before you tell us about some of what you, some of the specific things you've done, could you tell me why you decided to really emphasize reaching out to your community? 
Sure. Two of our session members, myself and another individual, we read externally focused churches. We were in a book study um, and it was done within our presbytery. Our church actually took the book and rolled with it. And then also you and Pastor Andrew from, who is now at the, I think he's at Louisville Seminary, correct? He was also strongly involved in getting us to be more involved in our community. So what we decided to do is instead of paying for a pulpit supply in a musician, we chose to get outside the pews and do something within our community. And I'm here to share with some of those ideas that we did with that. And um, it's a cost savings of about $400 per month for us. And as a result of that, we are actually feeding our souls, but also feeding the souls of our community. Yeah, really, you're, you're putting your worship into action um, yes. outside of the walls of your church once a month. So what are some of the things that you have done on those community Sundays or other ways you've reached out into the- Yeah, sure, I'd love to share some of those things. So like, let's say this winter time. So what we do is on the third Sunday is that, we, of course we do prayers and we do sing one hymn, but then we gather around in like three different tables and then we do an assembly line. And in our assembly line, what we do is we do care packages, little baggies. Maybe it's a box of raisins, a pack of hot chocolate, some candy. But then it's also a very nice thank you card, a prayer card, and then an inspirational message. An example would be as these baggies are given to our road commission. This would be the gentlemen, the ladies that are out plowing the roads. We want them to know that we as a church family care about what they're doing. We also give the um, baggies to um, specifically the EMS, the police department, the teachers. So each month we focus on a group of individuals that we think are need a little bit of an uplift and a little bit of love. And it gives our church members the opportunity to get to talk to one another and assemble things. But Chip, what I'm real excited to share with you is that I have found that the younger kids, the millennials, really like to do this. As a matter of fact, I had a very nice young lady that would come up to visit her grandfather from Michigan State. She would literally drive up on the third Sunday to be there because all she had to do was just show up and she got to do something. Wow. And um, that was great. This past December, our community activity was we decorated 200 Christmas cookies. So each individual member got to take like a dozen uh, cookies home and give them to somebody that they cared about, that they wanted to thank. But then we also use um, the cookies for the community Christmas meal, which our church sponsored. Uh, the, in November, our church took it on to peel 200, we actually do 400 pounds of potatoes. So the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we get together and we all are peeling the potatoes, which takes us a good hour. But that is a great service that we do for the community. And then in the summer, we do prayer walks for our community. Um, in the spring, we plant flowers um, for our food bank and also for the um, free medical clinic in our area. So we're trying to do some type of activity. And if one member has it on their heart to do something, we're like, yeah, go for it, do it. So we I encourage you to do it. I remember you telling me um, that you have gone to poorly attended youth sporting events. Before. Yes, so the big thing is we have a couple members that have kids that run cross country. And we have um, also members that are involved with volleyball. Two sports that you don't get a lot of attendances. So we wear these great aprons that say, have you hugged your Presbyterian? As a matter of fact, I'd love to just grab it. Can I grab it and show you really fast? Sure, sure. Okay. Isn't she great? She's so enthusiastic. Sorry, Chief, I didn't have this organized. But we wear these, these aprons that say, have you hugged your Presbyterian today? And we wear them out at community activities. And I think it's a really great opportunity. The cross country meet, they have over eight schools and it's really a nice event for them because the kids get fruit and then they get water and they get us cheering them on. So that's a really mm -hmm. fun event. Right, yeah. I remember you telling me once that if people ask you what you're doing there, you say, well, we're from First President, we care about your kids. 
Yes. And it seems like such a gift to the community. I remember yeah. you telling me also that you fixed a meal once for a road crew that was working on the road outside your church. Yeah, that was pretty, um, it was touching and very emotional. I think it was the first time these guys have ever been really thanked. So a few members, there was only three of us involved. It was very simple. They were repaving and redoing the septic line in front of our church. So we said to them, hey, we'd like to make you lunch on Friday. How about grilled cheese and tomato soup? Who doesn't love that? So we brought them in and we fed them. And it was interesting because the three of us went to each table and we asked them, what can we pray for you? Mm -hmm. It got very touching, very emotional. I think that my heart was like, wow, these folks really want to share what they're struggling with and we can pray for them. I think that they really appreciated the experience, but the nice thing about it was they knew that they were loved and they were cared for. And that's what the church family is all about, is showing love and compassionate for one another. Right. But Chick, I, I got to tell you about our biggest event, because the one question that you and Pastor Andrew asked me was, if our doors were to close, what would our community miss the most? And that's trunk or treat. We get over a thousand kids on Halloween night in front of our church. We close the street off, we open up our trunks, and it's just two hours full of kids coming through and getting pencils, boxes of raisins, crackers. We do other things besides just fruit, fruit, candy. We try to incorporate some other things. But what's so nice is the Downtown Business Association in Boyne City got involved, that they do a parade amongst the downtown area, but the parade ends at our church. So then the kids can use the restroom mm -hmm. and then they can be a part of that. So that's a really neat experience right. for and those I, kids. I just wanna repeat, you're a church of 41 numbers. Yes, so, I think yes. we're small and mighty. Yeah, yeah I think so too. So, um, you told me before, but I'm going to ask you, what, what's advice you would give to other churches that are thinking about um, wanting to reach out to their communities? I think the big thing is that you got to get outside your pews. I think that that was the biggest thing when you guys came and did the um, workshop with us is that we really need to get outside the pews. And granted, we're very, very small, but we, you can do a lot. One or two people can change things in your community. And that's what I really am impressed with. So we don't meet and we don't really sit in the pews on the third Sunday. We are doing something physically with our hands, either by planting, either by passing out, or even walking downtown and doing a prayer walk in the summertime. We're praying for our community. And it might just be four or five people that are walking and doing the prayer walks, but it's something that's different, and we're getting to know each member of our church at a different, um, in a different way because you spend time with them. Jesus walked everywhere, and I think it's important that we walk as well as a church family. Right. Paula, it's so clear that you love Point City, and <laughs> you love Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, you love Jesus, and it's just so encouraging to me to see how they're coming together in your church, really making a difference in your community. So thank you so very much for your testimony. We're so grateful for you. Thank you, Chip, and thank you for everything you do. And go get them, people. I think geez, pe folks need to know that they're loved and they can have um, Jesus' love as well. So just um, one more time, if we can go to the next slide, one more time, huddles are important, but nobody, go, on, go ahead, Brian, no one watches OSU to see the huddles. Jenny, is there time for questions or is, do I need to be done? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, let's do questions. First, let's give Paul another one. Isn't she inspiring? I mean, this, again, this is a church of 41 people doing all of these different things, it makes me um, inspired to think about the possibilities that all of our churches can do. Um, how about a question or a comment or a thought?
It'll work better if it's turned on. <laughs> While we're waiting, who's got a question or a thought or a comment? A complaint? <laughs> oh, I'll go back there in the green. Great. I, I'll repeat your question, so if you can. Hi. Hello. The yes, t- title? Yes, I think that's right. So, so the, the title of the book that Paula mentioned was Externally Focused Churches. Yes. And the one that I mentioned was called A New Day in the City. That's the one that I mentioned also. Thank you. All right, we're going to get done a little bit early then. Let me just go to the next Um, Station, next slide, please, Brian. Um, We're going to talk at my workshop um, about some other concrete examples. Um, I'm excited that um, Nancy Detterer, my longtime friend from college, is going to talk about a really great story from the church she was serving in um, Chicagoland about community dinners. I also want to tell you about a church in Detroit with their food pantry and another church outside of Detroit, uh, um, Retirement Center Satellite Church that they've set up. Then we'll have a chance for you to talk with each other about what your churches are doing or what you might do together. So I'd invite you to come to that workshop too. Thank you so much. Let me pray for you and for your churches. Gracious God, thank you so much for the... um, The mission you have given us, we thank you that Jesus didn't just breathe on his disciples and give them the spirit, but we have received his spirit too. God, help us to reach out to our communities. Thank you for the call and the equipping to do just that. We pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, so now we all, you'll be heading to your workshops. If you have your little half piece of paper, you have it. If you don't, um, if you're elder training, raise hands for elder training. You get to stay here. Um, so you've got time to run to the bathroom, run back across, top off your coffee, grab a snack. Um, now don't sit down over there, because you'll get, then we'll have to get you back up again. You'll be late for your workshops. Um, deacon training is going to be in room 120. We have uh, clerk trainings in the chapel, which is down this hall and back around. Earth care is in 115. CPR for the amygdala havening is in the lounge, which is just right over there. And oral history is in the choir room. Uh, Again, how does the spirit move you? You can go to whatever workshop you want at this point. We're we're not going to take attendance uh, in the room. Um, Would let you know that whenever your workshop is done and leaders, if that's at 11.45 or 11.50, by noon, have them out. Um, but whenever your workshop is finished, you'll just come on down and, and go through uh, our lunch line. And once everybody's in, we'll, we'll have a prayer partway through your meal. I want to remind you that our food is from Freedom a la Carte, which is a great organization that supports um, the women who have been involved in sex trafficking. And so we're very pleased to be able to support them and have those lunches for you. Uh, We do have uh, a handful of vegan gluten-free meals. Those will be kind of set back. So when you go through the line, um, be sure to ask for that if that's something that is is your dietary desire. Um, We're not going to put them in the main line because we don't want you to just say, ooh, I'd like to try that. Now, if you really want to try it, be at the end of the line because if there's some left, then you can try it. Uh, But otherwise... We want to be sure that they're available for folks who, who need that um, in, their, in their diet. So you've got about 10 minutes, which is plenty of time um, to move to your next group. So again, stop by uh, Fellowship Hall if you'd like. Otherwise, your workshops are at 10.30 to 11.45. You go to lunch, um, get your food. We'll sit, sit and eat, try to meet someone new. Uh, we'll have prayer, and then 12.45 to 2 is your second workshop. Uh, we'll close with worship then back in here, and we'll be all done at 2.30. So, thank you. <laughs>